For the latest information regarding the COVID-19 pandemic in Cupertino, please visit cupertino.org slash coronavirus. Um, with that, I'm going to turn to Dr. Cody for um, her presentation with her peers and her uh, slideshow. Good afternoon, uh, President Wasserman and members of the board. I'm joined by Dr. Ahmad Kamal, and we'll provide the presentation uh, today. So if I could have the first slide, we will begin as we always do uh, with our local um, epidemic curve. We'll just take one moment while that's coming up the, the back one slide. So as, as, as you all know, we are currently seeing a dramatic and really breathtaking explosion of cases. This is a pattern that we're seeing here in our county, as well as across the region, the state, the nation, and indeed uh, the globe. As of today, our seven day moving average uh, number of cases exceeds 4,000 new cases per day. And we know that these reported cases represent only a portion of our actual cases because now many people are using at-home antigen tests. And of course, those results um, aren't reportable and so not reflected in these numbers. So I think this just gives us a sense of the pace of things and the direction of things, um, but, but it's not exact. So the models, when might, when might we expect these cases to peak is a question uh, that we often have. And the honest answer is we, we don't quite know. Although some state models show we may peak to sometime towards the end of this month or perhaps early next. Um, and of course, remember that hospitalization peak will follow um, the peak in cases. So um, in summary, just to keep in mind before we go any further with this, presentation, we do know that we are facing some very, very difficult weeks ahead. In the next slide, um, we have uh, what I think is going to be what we will be following perhaps more the cases, um, with, which is our wastewater surveillance data. Um, these data have remained stable during the course of the pandemic. And so even as our case data may become uh, less reflective of what's going on, um, these data uh, will remain reflective of what's going on. And just what I want to note here is that in all four of the sewer sheds that we uh, track, the, um, the concentrations of SARS-CoV-2 have been increasing sharply um, in the last two weeks across all four sewer sheds. And in most cases, in three of the four sewer sheds, the current concentrations um, have surpassed um, levels that we saw during last winter's surge. The next slide shows um, our deaths. Since the pandemic began almost two years ago, uh, 1,951 people have died of COVID. And you can see on the right-hand side of this curve where we are now, it still looks pretty flat. We have a steady somewhere between five and 10 uh, deaths recorded each week. Um, but of course, um, uh, we don't know yet about how this current surge will eventually um, translate. And recall that at the peak of last winter surge, we had almost 160 deaths in one week in early January. So I'll now turn and walk you through vaccines um, because I want to, especially in prevention, in, in combination with other prevention layers, um, we hope that vaccines will translate to fewer preventable deaths in our community. Um, and I also, just as I go along, I want to make the point that hospitalization and death really aren't the only outcomes um, that we should be worried about, but they are the ones that we have a lot of uh, data uh, to share with you today. I have two slides that shows uh, case rates by vaccination status. This is the first one that really gives you the macro view. And of course, you'll notice that that purple line are the case rates um, among uh, people who remain unvaccinated in our community. And then the other lines towards the bottom are with um, various stages of vaccination. And so this is take home mess, uh, Take home lesson number one, which is that yes, 
vaccination does reduce your chance of becoming infected. And since you're less likely to become infected, you're less likely to spread infection if you're vaccinated. I think this is a very, very, very important point that I really can't underscore enough. Um, in our community where so many people are vaccinated and boosted, of course, most people you see with a breakthrough infection will be vaccinated and boosted. That does not mean that the vaccine is not working, far from it. I think this shows how well vaccination helps to um, reduce your chance of becoming a case. Um, so the next slide uh, zooms in on that lower right corner from the last slide um, and gives you a more a close up look on what's going on with case rates among the different vaccinated groups. So the vaccinated and eligible for a booster but not yet boosted are the green line at the top and the boosted are that orange line on the bottom. And uh, I think what you can see here is that the case rate among the eligible but not yet boosted um, is almost twice that among the boosted. So this is, uh, of course, reflects what we know that protection from the initial series does wane over time and you need a booster to uh, increase your level of protection uh, back to uh, where, where it was to better protect against infection. Uh, so the next slide, um, now we'll turn and look at hospitalizations. Um, so these are the both the uh, hospitalization rate over time, which is the blue line. Uh, and with it, you can see the case rate over time, which is the orange line. And I, I think I mentioned at our last meeting when Omicron was just beginning um, to emerge, was that a chief concern was that even if Omicron in general caused a, a milder illness as compared to previous variants, just a small proportion of, uh, in, if just a small proportion of, of, of cases land in the hospital, it could translate to still a very large number and enough to overwhelm, overwhelm hospitals. And, and that still is a very significant um, concern. So this shows the relationship between cases and hospitalizations over time. And you can see as we have uh, as we all, have all experienced how the blue line lags the orange line. So hospitalizations lag cases. And I think the question is, what will be the relationship now between hospitalizations and cases? Um, we hope that those lines will diverge a lot, um, but it's a little bit early to, to make a call. I also just want to make a couple comments about the world word mild and Omicron is just like a cold. Um, so I have also used this word to describe a typical illness from Omicron, but there's a couple of important points I want to make. First of all, you know, when a doctor says mild, they might be thinking, well, you're not in the hospital and you're not on oxygen, so it's mild. Um, and that's a little different than a lay person who might think mild means I get to, you know, watch a movie in bed and, and drink my favorite hot beverage. Um, so, but the truth is that people with Omicron can feel quite miserable uh, for several days. Second is that these mild, quote, mild illnesses are taking many out of the workplace and really creating staffing crises and, and havoc across many sectors, um, which impacts everyone. And finally, and this is uh, perhaps of most concern is that a certain proportion of those with COVID infection will go on to develop long COVID, and that is a very big deal. So hospitalization and death are not the only outcomes that should be of concern for us, which is why uh, we really continue to emphasize why, why implementing um, and focusing on multiple layers of prevention however we can uh, in order to prevent infection in the first place. Um, that's that's still quite important. The next slide um, uh, shows hospitalization rate by vaccination status um, among adults, uh, people greater than 18 in our county. So in addition to um, reducing the, uh, the risk of infection, you can see here 
that vaccination and boosting dramatically, dramatically reduce the risk of being hospitalized. So the, the most recent rates that you can see there on the far right um, show almost a 20 fold difference uh, between the rate of hospitalization among those who uh, aren't vaccinated versus who are vaccinated. So vaccines and boosters um, are very protective uh, against hospitalization. Um, with that, I'm gonna turn the presentation over to Dr. Kamal, um, who's gonna share with you updates on testing, vaccination, um, hospitalizations, uh, hospital status, and therapeutics. Thank you, Dr. Cody, and thank you, Supervisor. So our, this graph shows our testing in the county. Our average testing count has exceeded 25,000 tests per day for the first time in this pandemic and is continuing to increase. This is almost 10 times the state guideline and equates to more than 1% of the entire county's population being tested each and every day. Furthermore, this is an underestimate of the actual number of tests being done because it doesn't count for the increasing number of at-home antigen tests that are being done throughout the county. And as many of you know, starting this weekend, those tests will be covered by insurance with no copay for a minimum of eight tests per month. Next slide. Uh, once again, the county health system continues to lead in the number of tests being done but it's great to see that the lines for both Kaiser and Stanford shown in yellow and orange do show an upswing um, in the most recent period. Next slide. Um, as I mentioned, at-home antigen tests are increasingly being used in the community. So both our testing and just as importantly, our total case counts are underestimated. So as a reminder, if someone has COVID symptoms and a positive antigen test at home, they do not need to get a confirmatory PCR test. They should just follow the isolation guidelines and only need to see a healthcare provider if they have symptoms that require it, not just because of their positive tests. Next slide. So the county is currently distributing antigen tests to several settings. Um, to aid in testing and to help return essential workers to their jobs if they have no symptoms. Uh, this slide lists some of the distribution that has been done and is continuing to be done through the county. In addition to this, the state of California is distributing tests directly to schools. Next slide. In terms of vaccinations, uh, we have seen a bit of a drop off in demand, but are still delivering a large number of boosters shown in purple, which is even more important than ever. And as Dr. Cody said, given the Omicron variant, we're very important to get this out in the community. Next slide. The county health system continues to give the lion's share of vaccinations in our county along with retail pharmacies. Next slide. Um, however, we are happy that we have seen an increase in testing by our healthcare partners, including Stanford, Kaiser, and Palo Alto Medical Foundation, showing um, an increase, um, and that will hopefully continue as we go forward. Next slide. And as a reminder, all persons above the age of 12 are eligible for a booster five months after completion of their initial series or two months after receiving the J&J vaccine, and we are encouraging everybody who's a little eligible to get a booster. Next slide. In terms of hospitalizations, we have seen an increase with 403 adult COVID hospitalizations as of yesterday. Uh, this increase has not been as great as the increase in number of cases, which could indicate decreased vir virulence, but as Dr. Cody said, we do know that hospitalizations lag behind cases and neither the case count or the hospitalizations have reached a peak yet. So we are not out of the woods yet. Furthermore, given how easily Omicron has spread, there is a risk to the health system because even if a smaller percent of people get hospitalized, a, very, a, a small percent of a very large number is a large number. But even a greater risk to the healthcare system is staffing, as Dr. Cody mentioned, with mild illnesses occurring among hospital workers. So we are keeping a close eye on that. 
The next slide compares the different surges. So how is the surge different? Well, this slide shows how we are in a different place than we were back in the spring of 2020. Back then we had a highly virulent strain of the virus with no vaccine. Our PPE supply was tenuous and there weren't any effective treatments. Now we have a fast spreading variant, but also we are much better equipped most importantly because of uh, one of the highest vaccination rates in the country, but also better PPE availability and multiple effective treatments available for both early and late disease. Next slide. Because of those facts, our ICU bed count is staying stable uh, compared to last winter when we saw a sustained decline, as you can see here on the left when we had a downward trend. We are now seeing Certainly more fluctuation, but not a sustained decrease. However, we are watching this very closely because of the high number of cases and the risk of staffing shortages and the fact that our cases have yet to peak. Our next slide. Also very important to note is that our emergency room volume is higher than it has ever been, both for COVID and non-COVID illnesses. And this, once again, is also impacted by uh, staffing shortages across the continuum of healthcare and so clearly presents a strain on the healthcare system. Next slide. And finally, I wanna give a brief update on therapeutics. As I mentioned, we are now fortunate to have multiple therapies available for pre-exposure, post-exposure, mild to moderate disease, and for severe disease. Out of all of these, by far the most important is vaccines, which can prevent you from getting sick in the first place. But for those people who do get sick, we do have treatments for both early and late disease and are allocating it to healthcare providers across the county. And finally, I just wanted to, next slide. I just wanted to mention uh, one of the most exciting developments, which is that we now have oral medication that can be taken by people with mild COVID symptoms and prevent them from progressing to more severe disease. Our county has developed a website which any provider can access and view real-time availability of these medications for their patients and get them a supply. And once again, um, these are great developments, but the clearly the vaccines are of foremost important to prevent you from needing any of this. And with that, I will turn it over back to Dr. Cody and take questions. We're happy to take your questions. I'm muted again, there we go. Thank you very much, Dr. Cody and Dr. Kamal. Um, I appreciate that, I appreciate the graphics, the colorful page numbers. It was very easy to discern the report. I picked out a number of different slides, but I wanna talk, turn to supervisors first for any questions they may have of you before I make a couple of comments. I don't see any hands raised. Oh, there's a hand raised, Vice President Ellenberg. You couldn't get, couldn't get there fast enough. Um, I did want to ask a couple of questions um, about some, some things that are going on in the in the community. Thank you very much, Dr. Cody, and all of the partners uh, for the report. Um, given the impact of this current wave on the operations of, of schools and congregate settings, I'd like to ask that future reports include information on outbreaks, uh, response support, and guidance from our county public health team uh, to these other other settings. Uh, and in particular today, I want to ask about cases amongst uh, staff and people in custody uh, at our jails in light of both the vaccination order for congregate settings and lower vaccination rates among people um, in custody as compared with the general population. So my first question uh, is for Dr. Cody regarding the health order issued, which mandates vaccination for employees within high risk settings. I'm, I'm aware, as I know you are, of the current staffing shortages in custody due to a number of deputies uh, being out with COVID. Uh, given that situation, is there any consideration around enforcement of the vaccine requirement, um, at least until an adequate number of staff have been cleared to return to duty? Thank you for the question, Supervisor Ellenberg. Um, you know, I, I share your concern uh, about the, the outbreaks in the jails and in other congregate settings. And, it, and in all of these settings, of course, is extraordinarily difficult um, with staff illnesses. Um, and so the question of how do we best 
thread the needle to be most protective um, is is very challenging. Um, and, you know, sometimes we need to try a, a number of different things. And I just want to assure you um, that we're working very, very closely um, with Custody Health to try to understand how to best protect um, the health uh, of the inmates. Um, with regards to the order, this is um, complex because, as you may know, um, custody is both under the county's vaccination mandate order, as well as falls under the health officer order as a congregate setting. Um, so a bit more complex uh, than other congregate settings that fall under the health officer order because they're two different ones. So custody falls under both. For the latest information regarding the COVID-19 pandemic in Cupertino, please visit cupertino.org slash coronavirus.